Hello. Can you guys hear me at the back? Thank you. Uh, so welcome to DevConf US. Uh, this is the systems engineering track. Uh, my name is Yash. I'll be your moderator for this track. Uh, the next talk is by Wayman Long, on, uh, and the title of the talk is uh, Spectrum Meltdown, a Primer. So I'll let him take over. Thanks. OK. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think you all heard of the name Spectrum and Meltdown before. If you haven't heard it, then this is not the right talk for you. So. Um, basically, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, how the spectrum meltdown, um, this kind of security bug come, out, come about, and, and then what kind of uh, vulnerability are uh, actually um, discovered in those uh, uh, security bugs, and what are we, we, we doing from the operating, operating system side? to mitigate the, uh, the defect uh, that are in the computer chip itself. So um, the reason why we have this kind of um, uh, security vulnerability is because uh, we of our quest for ever higher and higher performance in the computer chips. And in doing so, we are, doing, we are making some shortcut that uh, in the end, lead to this kind of security vulnerability that we, we talk about. And um, the, some people would regret doing things too aggressive. So, and finally, um, I will talk a little bit about um, what the uh, computer chip maker are doing uh, in the future to try to mitigate some of the, the problems that we currently have in our current set of CPU chips. So, first of all, what is Spectra and Meltdown? Um, they are a new class of uh, CPU vulnerability um, due to a capability in computer hardware called speculative execution. And there, up to now, there are a, a number of different um, security vulnerability in this category. The most well-known one are as follows. Uh, we have Spectra V1, which is called the bound check by path. Um, we will talk about each of the vulnerability in a bit more detail in the following slide. Uh, this slide just gives you um, the set that I'm going to talk about. Special V2 is branch target injection. And, and then we have meltdown, which is uh, we internally requires the variant B. So they all have a number of system. One, two, three, four, five. And after that, I talk about the speculative store by path. Uh, which we internally call variant 4. And then uh, I also talk a little bit about uh, a new one called uh, L1 Terminal Fort, which was just uh, an embargo three days ago. So this is a new security bug that people were talking about um, in the past few days. And there are also, beyond the main one, there are also a couple of uh, variants um, that I, I'm not going to, to talk about because uh, it will just take too, too much time. Uh, like the, we have a special V1.1 called Bunched Bypass on store or Speculative Buffer Flow. And then there's another one called Next Spectra that allow you to do, uh, to perform Speculative Attack from, from the network side. So you don't have to actually run on the computer itself. You just send some package to the computer, and then you can uh, extract some information out from it. But the thing with this battery is the, the, the bit weight is very low. So you can extract maybe a few by every hour or so. So yet, yeah, although this is very possible, but the amount of data that you extract is very, very minimal. So unless you can have a uh, um, continuous do the attack for, for a few weeks or so, you won't be able to get much information out of it. OK, why we have this kind of security bug? Um, first of all, I would like to talk about um, the different uh, memory within the computer hierarchy. So at the, within the CPU chip, um, the fastest memory you have is the register. You, you can usually assess the data in the register within one clock cycle. Um, and then beyond that, you have to assess the data from the cache. Um, in modern computer chip, 
Yeah, usually I go uh, B level of cash, you have the L1 cash, uh, level 2, L2 cash, and L3 cash. And then beyond that, you have to assess the data from memory. This table shows you um, the latency or the amount of time you need to assess the data from different level of the memory hierarchy. So from the register, you need one cycle. From the L1 cache, maybe about four cycles. All this timing depends on the CPU itself. Different CPU may have different uh, timing for different level of cache. Uh, this is just one example. I use a Haswell i7-4770 CPU as an example. So um, for that CPU, the, the amount of time you need to assess data in the L2 cache is 12 cycles. And from the L3 cache, um, depending on where, where, where you are, the data. Also, L3 is, is, a one, is one single set of cache shared by all the CPU core. So relative to exactly where the core is and where the uh, cache slide that the data have, uh, the timing can vary a little bit. That's why it is a, there's a, you, have a, you have a minimum and a maximum, so depending on exactly the, the location. The further the data away is from the actual CPU core, the more time you need to assess the data. And for RAM, for physical memory, um, you actually need quite a lot of time. Uh, so we are talking about about 100, nan about 100 nanoseconds in order to assess one data from, <coughs> from the memory. And with a 3 gigahertz, 3.4 gigahertz CPU, one clock cycle is about uh, 0.3 nanosecond. So you can think about 0.3 nanosecond compared with 100 nanosecond, you're talking about um, a difference of 300. So uh, you can do one operation uh, in one cycle, and then the next operation, you need to get the data from memory. And then you can see, you have to wait about 300 cycles before you can actually get the data. And in between, if you have nothing to do, the CPU will sit idle, doing nothing, basically. That's why uh, modern CPU have a lot of way to speed up the operation. Um, if you listen to the talk in the morning about um, uh, the cycle, the life of a CPU within in a millisecond, uh, the speaker talked a lot about the internal operation of the CPU and what kind of optimization they can done to speed things up and making it faster. So in order to hide all this memory latency, there are a lot of ways that the CPU can do. Um, the easiest way is pipelining. So basically, um, you can break up an instruction into smaller operations before you have micro op. So you can break up into four or five or even more. And then in each cycle, you do one micro op, and then it cycles to a second one, and you can pipeline the whole thing. So you can do things in parallel. So in essence, it extends the time you have to do, oh, sorry. In essence, it extends the time that you have to do, oh, maybe I can use a mic easier. In essence, you can extend the time that you, you have to do the instruction, but at the same time, maintain, still maintain a very high cost speed. But there is only so much you can do with pipelining. Um, so the second way the CPU can help to speed up operation is by doing uh, our order execution. So um, in the instruction stream, you usually have uh, the first instruction and second instruction and so on. Um, when they are one in computer, then um, they are not actually one in the order of the instruction stream. The computer chip will analyze the dependency between the instruction. And if they find that the instruction and uh, they have no dependency, then they may execute them out of order. Some instruction may get executed ahead of the other one and so on. Uh, so they can extract the parallel sum within your computer uh, instruction stream. And beyond the order ex execution, you also have, have to do branch prediction because whenever you do, you hit a branch instruction. Uh, modern computer software are usually very, very branch, especially the um, general purpose one. Um, you will hit a branch instruction maybe every six or seven instruction. So when you hit a plan instruction, then the, the computer, ha the CPU has to evaluate the, the condition that lead to the branch to see whether you take one branch or the second one. 
And depending on what kind of uh, instruction you do before the branch, it can take a while to determine whether you you are taking the first branch or the second one. So uh, in most computer hardware, they have some dedicated logic to do branch prediction. So you you predict ahead of time which branch you are most likely to take in, and then execute those instructions uh, ahead. So, and then we go into speculative ex execution. Why is called speculative execution? Because usually after the branch prediction. So because after the branch, if you, your prediction hardware predict correctly, then the instruction after the branch will be retired after, immediately after that. If the prediction is wrong, then they have the full order instruction that you have done before and full order intermediate data and and then go to the next branch, the, the, the second branch, and do the execution again. So uh, this create a pipeline for, uh, store and slow thing down. Um, that usually don't happen that often, but uh, when that happen, it will slow down the the, the computer chips. So what? So all the instructions that are in code predicted will be rolled back. Uh, that means the for within the, the architectural state like the, the content and register, the content memory, um, the the conditional flag, etc. Those information will will be changed back to the original form. Um, so you won't see any side effect because of the misbedict branch. But there are other micro architectural stay, like the quantum of cache. They are not go back because within the uh, when you do expected execution, it's possible that you load some data from memory, and those data will be stored in the cache. Uh, even if from, uh, at the end you find out that um, you have misprediced the branch, the the information in the cache won't be thrown away. They stay in the cache, and. And is this uh, changes in the microarchitectural state that lead to the uh, all these speculative execution bug that we are talking about? So um, now I talk about what is a side channel. A side channel is basically an side channel attack. Is basically, attack based on information gained from the actual implementation of a CPU. As I said before, uh, the microarchitectural state, like the content of a cache. Uh, will not be rolled back, so those information are in the cache. And if you have a piece of information in the cache, um, <coughs> what you can observe is that if you are trying to assess the data that are in the cache, it's much faster than when you try to assess the data that are in memory, and you have to load it first into the cache, and then from the cache to the register. That will take a longer time. So um, for the chart channel, I, Typically, the most commonly used time, uh, side channel is the timing information, like the time you, you need to assess uh, some data, kind of some piece of data. Um, there are also other side channels that are possible, like uh, you are able to monitor the power consumption of a CPU or of a commercial system. You can infer whether the, the CPU is PC or the CPU is idle or, or things like that. Um, you have some external device, you can actually can monitor the the automatic radiation or even the sun coming out from the computer and then infer some information on what the computer is actually doing. Uh, for, for, for the kind of uh, spectrum meltdown attack, uh, the, the side channel they use is the timing. So <coughs> what the, um, um, the attack what the what you can do um, in order to perform the attack is uh, before you execute instruction, you read the time, the current time from the um, the TSC counter, and then after you execute instruction, you can read the TSC counter again and see how much time has elapsed between the before and after the instruction, and from there, from the actual execution time of the instruction, you can infer whether that piece of information you will try to assess in the cache or, or in the memory. And cache channel is the most common one that are used in all those attacks. 
Um, other side channels are also possible, like in the, in the next lecture paper, they talk about another side channel. Um, by using the, the time, you need to execute an AVX512 uh, instruction. You know, those are the, the new um, SIMD instructions that are in the new Intel CPU. And those, those are instructions are very resource intensive. When you want those instructions, what happens is the CPU actually slow down. They reduce the, the clock speed because they consume so much power. And usually when you don't use the uh, instruction, uh, what the CPU does is they turn off the circuitry of those, uh, those execution units that, use the, that are required by the AVX uh, instruction. And when you, that means that the first time you execute a AVX uh, instruction, you have to start up the, well, you have to turn on the circuit and then warm up a bit and then before you can actually run the instruction. So that's why there's latency. So what the paper we're talking about is uh, they look at uh, the latency in doing the execute those instructions and see whether uh, the, the instruction unit actually, the execution unit have been turned on before or not. So those are the piece of information that they can use to infer whether uh, some of the state within the, the CPU chips. Okay, uh, Spectre V1, this is uh, the first uh, uh, Spectre attack uh, that disclosed in January, I think in January 4th. Um, so basically, it, it's just a simple branch instruction and a if statement, and you, if, the instruct, if the condition is true, you do a memory access. But the thing is, um, uh, this kind of simple um, instruction uh, is what we call a um, spectra gadget. So those are, so you, you can make use of this uh, spectra gadget to assess a secret information uh, within the, the uh, another way, BX. So the branch predictor that the way that the CPU uh, train the branch predictor is that um, it will you have some kind of internal state table and it will determine how much the branch has taken in the past. If the branch has been taken many times in the past, you assume that the next time you hit the same um, instruction again, it will take the same branch. So past history, we use the past history to predict the, the future outcome. So you can actually train the predictor to predict that one branch is more likely than the next. So the, the attacker can have a piece of software that train a particular branch prediction address to, to, to do a certain branch. And, and then after the train the predictor, it will then execute the special gadgets. Um, so, uh, what uh, the attacker can do is fussing out all the possible data items um, that are in the A array. So all this uh, data will not be in the cache. Now, um, now you pass a value X, let's say a very big value, so you can assess a, an array very, very far out of the, the bound of the zip of the, the array check. So the, the actual X value can be much larger than the length. But if the, if the length parameter happen to, you need to assess from memory. Then within, before the, the actual length can be acquired from the memory, there's a period of time that the CPU has nothing to do, and so speculative execution kick in. So you assume that the branch will be taken, so you will go ahead to try to read the, the BX, away, get the data in, and then as use it to in, infer, uh, use the data from the secret, um, secret value, and then use it to, to indirectly assess another piece of data that, that you know that, that can be brought into a cache. And after the branch fell, um, later on you can then load each of the value from the A away one by one and see how much time it takes. Let's say the secret value is uh, one. Then uh, you speculate execute the, 
the um, instruction um, to assess the content of A, B, X times 512, that means you will assess the uh, 512 value of the A away. So you will get that piece of data will be fetched into the cache. And, and after the speculative execution, you can assess each item um, from from A0 to A512 and then A124 and so on. You can, and then you can determine which one you can you can do it in the shortest time. Then that is the secret value. They're actually in the BX way that you want to to get. So this is how they infer the value of the secret value uh, by using speculative execution. But it, by looking at how much time you need to assess the way via the cache um, and to, to see which uh, secret area are the most likely one. And, and there's reason why it's called the bound check bypass. So you actually bypass the bound check and do the speculatively executed instruction to get the data uh, from the secret value. So the way to fix the issue is uh, you can you can either insert a, a, a kind of low fence between the branch instruction and the array access to box speculation. Uh, a low fence is an instruction that the CPU provide to allow you to stop um, doing any speculative execution forward until you uh, until the result of all the period instruction have finished. So in this way, um, no speculative execution will be allowed. It. Another way to to fix this issue is uh, using some uh, what, what is called the data dependent except masking. Uh, like in the Linux kernel, they have a special macro called array index no spec that allow you to uh, dereference an array index. The way it does it is. Uh, it makes use of the bound value itself um, in the computation to produce another index value because that computation depends on the, the actual bound that, uh, in the check. So the, and because of the data dependency, uh, subsequent instruction will not, be, will not be allowed until you resolve the dependency. That means you, uh, after you get the bound check value in. So that slow thing down that um, block the speculative execution from, from happening. Oh, I see a 10 minutes. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And the, the other one is uh, spec bound target injection, which is basically um, uh, the a lot of CPU have uh, some kind of indirect branch instruction that you get the target of the, of the branch address from a register or from a memory location instead of directly branch to a certain instruction. And that indirect branch value can also be, uh, there are also some circuit in the CPU to speed up the, um, the indirect branch by, by speculating, executing of where the branch address will be. It's called a PD. Uh, the branch target buffer, and this, like the branch uh, detection unit, can be trained. So you can train it to assume a certain branch address. So if the branch address happen to be uh, a memory in user space, then the the computer will execute some speculatively execute some instruction in in the user space, which is very dangerous. If, if it happens in the, within the kernel, which you have uh, ability to see everything, uh, or you see every data in the uh, in the memory address space. So there are two ways to fix this vulnerability. One way is called the uh, the web pulling, the return trampoline, which is basically a software technique that kind of simulate um, an indirect branch by using a return instruction instead. So it is a, it's a dance around the stack, how to manipulate the stack so that you can do the branch by return instruction. And another way to fix that is uh, they, you can make use of best, um, a special MSR, the machine specific register that provide by medical code update. 
uh, to limit indirect branch projection. Uh, there, uh, what we call the IBRS, the indirect branch restriction speculation. When you turn on this mode, then the the indirect branch prediction unit will know that um, if you are in different privilege mode, like you are in the user mode, uh, you do some indirect branch, and then after that you go to kernel, you in the kernel mode, then it will skip, will ignore all the uh, training data for the user space in the other branch and just focus on what you what you have done in, in the kernel space. Uh, you also sometimes you also flush the uh, all the indirect branch prediction data out so that you won't use it uh, within the, the kernel space. And okay. Let's go to the next one. Meltdown. Meltdown is actually um, a different, a slightly different kind of uh, speculative attack. It more um, um, uh, a bug in the CPU itself, actually. So for or 86, Meltdown only affect the Intel CPU, but not AMD. Uh, the reason is because um, for in the Intel CPU, they, they are doing a, a lot more aggressively in terms of speculative execution. So before a memory access happens, you are supposed to check whether you are allowed to access the memory, that particular memory address before you move ahead to load the instruction. But uh, in the case of Intel CPU, um, the, the protection check was done after they had already started speculative execution or speculatively loaded the memory data. Um, that, in the case of AMD, they, they do the position check beforehand, so they don't have this problem. Um, but for, for Intel, um, apparently they, they did it as in a different way. Um, and the way to mitigate this uh, problem is to limit what you can see in the user space. So in the user mode, um, because in order to execute the meltdown attack, you you have to be able to see the whole kernel address space, and and to fix that, uh, what we can, what we have done um, at least in the Linux kernel, and I think in all in in the other OS like Windows also, is called the PDI page table or kernel page table isolation. So when you're in user, when you're in user mode, you only see a limited amount of uh, kernel data, and then when you go call into kernel, they switch the pay table to see the whole set of kernel space. So, uh, but that switching of page table uh, costs time, so that, that is why um, <coughs> all this medication will slow things down. Uh, you, we have done some benchmark, it, it will slow down performance by about uh, a few percent, depending exactly what, what your application is doing. Okay, and the, and then this is the, the variant four. It called a speculative store bypass. Um, it actually, um, um, okay, let, let me skip this one. This is the latest one called the uh, L1 terminal four. Oh, oh, there's a error in the slide. Okay. Um, it, this problem is actually quite similar to Meltdown. It's again due to uh, Intel doing too aggressive a job in speculative execution. So you know about virtual memory. When you have, um, um, they have a page table to translate the virtual address to, to, the, uh, to the physical address. And there is a bit in the page table to define whether the page table entry is valid or not. If the page table entry isn't valid, it's supposed to generate just a simple page form. But um, what Intel does is the, they, they, even if the page is not valid, they will assume that um, the, the address portion of the page table entry uh, corresponds to the physical address of the of the data page that you want to assess and actually speculatively load the data. And once you, the data is loaded in the cache, you can use a cache uh, time sign channel to retrieve the data. But that won't happen when the data uh, is in the L1 cache. If the data isn't in the L1 cache, uh, it will just 
You won't do anything. Um, it is um, kind of a shortcut they, they use to speed up in the performance because um, maybe they think that um, that is the most likely the case that the where the data will be. And for this one, um, there are a number. Of, one minute. There are a number of medication that are possible. Um, Within the kernel, we use a technique called PTE table inversion. So for those entries with a, with a non valid address, uh, usually what is stored in the page table entry itself is some kind of metadata. Um, they usually start from zero. And with PTE inversion, instead of starting from zero, we start from the very top, the, the last uh, possible value going down the end. Because in, in many cases, you won't have a, a system that have, have much more many that are allowed by system. For instance, most modern x86 uh, video uh, allow 46 bit uh, physical address space, which translates to 64 terabyte. You won't easily find a system with 64 terabyte memory. The most common you will find will be, will be a, a few terabyte at most. So you start from, from the top, then um, the, <clears throat> the address stored in the page table entry won't match any existing physical memory, so you won't do any, you won't be able to, to do speculative execution on, for, on those address. But the problem is within a VM, um, the, it will, within a VM you have a whole set of virtual memory and you don't trust what the VM is running. The VM may contain a whole kernel that uses this um, medication to attack the host. And so uh, in order to, to mitigate this issue, um, there are two ways that you can do. You can, uh, within, with the high, when the high power server needs to go back into the VM, you have to flush the content of L1 cache. Um, but even then, it's not enough um, because we, if the CPU support SMT, so you, uh, you can have two flat. Um, serving the same core. Uh, they also share the L1 cache. So if one, one flag is running in the VM, and another flag is running in the host, then the, the one in the VM can spy on what the, what the host, the other flag in the host can read into the L1 data cache. And so, so the only sure way to, to avoid the problem is actually to, to disable SMT. Okay. Um, I will stop from here uh, as the time is up. Uh, any question? I think we have five minutes for questions, right? Yeah, so we have three minutes for questions. So I can do we have three questions. So okay. I request you to stand here and I'll take the mic. Okay, sure. Questions? No questions? Do you, do you, well, you have three minutes. Do you want something to explain for okay. three minutes? Okay, um, this is actually the last slide. Um, looking forward, the, the CPU manufacturer are actually uh, trying to fix some of the issue in silicon. Right now, what we have done is solve um, in the software, which is kind of like a workflow work one. Uh, it's not a permanent solution because it slows things down and makes things more complicated within the, the operating system itself. So this, at least for the meltdown and spectral V2, I think for Intel uh, in the next uh, next generation of CPU, the the Cascade Lake, they're going to have silicon fix for for this for those two, and also for the for the L1TF uh, vulnerability, and probably the SSB also. The only one that harder to fix is spectral V1 because um, branch prediction. It's, it's very fundamental to um, how all these uh, speculation, how to fundamental to improving the performance of CPU, and it, it's pretty hard to, to fix that in silicon. They may have provide some way to make it harder to, to exploit the vulnerability, but uh, we still probably need to um, find all the issue, all the special gadget in the code and try to minimize the use of those. And also, the one thing is, um, since this is a new class of CPU vulnerability, uh, and there are a lot of researchers actively researching in this area, so we expect to, to uh, there, there are more to come in the near future.
and okay, um, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks.